Bueno, muy buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a este Viernes de Soluciones Sostenibles. Mi nombre es Tatiana Carreño, soy especialista técnico senior acá en el Consejo Colombiano de Construcción Sostenible. Los voy a estar acompañando en este espacio. Y el día de hoy tenemos un tema muy interesante que es eco cómo el comisionamiento nos ayuda a la eficiencia energética en los proyectos. Y además tenemos unos invitados muy especiales, nos acompaña María Alexandra Cardona, nos acompaña Josh y Jason, los tres del GBCI y del USGBC. Welcome Josh, welcome Jason, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you María Alex also. Eh, recorda, les recordamos que la sesión va a ser en inglés, no vamos a tener traducción simultánea, entonces agradecemos si al final tienen preguntas para Josh, para Jason, eh, las puedan hacer en inglés y si no pues intentaremos hacerlas, eh, pues hacer la traducción. Eh, no siendo más, le doy la palabra a María Alexandra Cardona. Muchas gracias Tatiana, muchas gracias a todos los que se conectaron el día de hoy. Este tema es súper interesante y, y, y siempre muy retador para todos entender cómo el comisionamiento y esta palabra comisionamiento, qué significa y cómo aporta dentro de un proyecto en proceso de certificación LEED. Eh, simplemente de mi parte comentarles eh, algo sobre la alianza eh, con el GBCI y el Consejo Colombiano de Construcción Sostenible. Desde ya hace más de, en el año 2015 se inició todo este proceso de la alianza entre el Consejo Colombiano de Construcción Sostenible y el GBCI y el USGBC y a partir del año 2018 eh, formalizamos eh, la última, digamos como la, la, la más reciente parte de esta alianza y fue tener un funcionario aquí en Colombia con la finalidad de acercarnos al mercado eh, y facilitar y acelerar esa adopción en las buenas prácticas en construcción sostenible eh, para facilitar recursos educativos y proporcionar mayor conocimiento siempre de la mano del consejo. Y nuestro objetivo es el de mejorar los beneficios ambientales y de salud humana en todo el entorno construido, proporcionando a las comunidades eh, los recursos eh, suficientes para tener edificios y ciudades sostenibles y resilientes. Eh, entonces cuentan con nosotros acá y estoy para servirles. Eh, darles algo de números eh, de lo que está pasando hoy día de LID en Colombia. Hoy ya tenemos más de 470 proyectos registrados en nuestra plataforma que suman más de 13 millones 600 de millones de metros cuadrados de espacios en el país que están en este proceso de certificación y ya más de 6 millones que se encuentran certificados en un total de 243 proyectos en los diferentes niveles de LID. Eh, yo los dejo hasta aquí y le voy a dar la palabra a Jason y a Josh. Jason, thank you very much. Josh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be part of this uh, webinar. And, uh, and thank you for sharing all your knowledge and experience about commissioning. So, um, jo Jason, your word, okay? All right, great, Josh, if you wanna bring up the slides and we'll get started. All right, great, thank you for uh, having us here to speak. Um, I'm Jason Salter. I'm a lead certification reviewer and team lead with the Energy HVAC team at GBCI, as well as my colleague here, Josh Draghi, who's also a lead certification reviewer with the Energy HVAC team. We focus with our review work on the Energy HVAC credits, which primarily consist of the Energy and Atmosphere credits and the Indoor Environmental Quality credits. Um, today, we're going to be talking about lead commissioning. But first, Josh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Green Business Certification Incorporated, which is more commonly referred to as GBCI, is the premier green building uh, industry leader in performance and practice globally. Through rigorous certification professional credentialing programs, GBCI drives the adoption of green building and sustainable building practices. We have multiple rating systems under our umbrella, as you can see here, that include LEED, EDGE, Park Smart, and WELL. And with those, we focus on reducing energy usage, water consumption, improving indoor and outdoor environment, 
for people and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Our LEED rating system is the most widely used green building rating system in the world. And today we're gonna to cover one topic within the LEED rating system, which is building commissioning. So today's discussion is how does commissioning contribute to energy efficiency in a LEED project? Within the discussion, we're going to talk about the intent of commissioning, the requirements of the commissioning process, how commissioning has evolved within the LEED rating system versions, who can be the commissioning authority or commissioning agent, documentation requirements for commissioning, and we're gonna end with the benefits of commissioning. So when we talk about LEED and building commissioning, what do we mean? Well, historically green building certification standards such as LEED have been the primary driver for building commissioning. The LEED rating system recognizes that the commissioning process is critical to ensuring high performance buildings. Early involvement of the commissioning authority brings or helps prevent long-term maintenance issues and wasted energy by verifying the design meets the owner's project requirements and functions as intended. The LEED rating system emphasizes that in an operationally effective and efficient building, the staff understands what systems are installed and how they function. Staff must also have training for optimizing system performance so that efficient design is carried through and expected performance is realized. So let's just quickly sort of define commissioning and understand some of its key components. Commissioning can provide a range of benefits for the building owners and facility managers. Commissioning is a quality control process of verifying and documenting that a building and all of its systems and assemblies are planned, designed, installed, tested, operated, and maintained to meet the owner's project requirements. Commissioning integrates the planning, delivery, verification, and risk management of a building's functions. It is not another layer or step in the design build process, but rather it's a means to produce buildings that do everything they're intended to do throughout the building's life cycle. For LEED certification, third-party commissioning is mandatory. As you probably know, if you pursued a LEED certification on a project, the prerequisites are all mandatory requirements within LEED. And one of those prerequisites is fundamental commissioning and verification. The intent of our prerequisite is to support the design, construction, and eventual operation of a project that meets the owner's project requirements for energy, water, indoor environmental quality, and durability. In addition to the prerequisite, we have a credit which you can earn up to six points for. There are two options within that credit. Option one is enhanced systems commissioning, which actually includes two paths. One is just enhanced commissioning and one is enhanced and monitoring based commissioning. And then the second option is envelope commissioning, which is new with lead version four and 4.1. So why is commissioning required in lead? Today, we're gonna to focus primarily on new construction commissioning. Commissioning for other LEED versions does exist such as LEED O&M, which is sometimes commonly referred to as LEED existing buildings. And some of the other rating systems do have a few different requirements and steps, but the overall concept is the same. And the goal in all instances is to provide value to the building owners, occupants, and the community. Josh, next slide. So the historical intent. Over the course of LEED, you can see here that the intent itself has not changed that much. It has always been to verify and ensure that fundamental building elements and systems are designed and installed and calibrated to operate as intended. However, what has changed, especially with version four and 4.1, is that the scope has expanded a bit to include more than just the energy HVAC related systems. It now includes more of the water and envelope systems. The intent hasn't changed that much, but the requirements have. And 
there's some examples of that, which we'll go into more details in just a minute, are that the who can be the commissioning authority has been clarified over time. The specific systems, as I mentioned before, that are required to be commissioned have been increased and the scope has been uh, added to. And that as new methods have been added or new methods have been added as technology has become more available. So now we're gonna look at the fundamental commissioning changes and these are the requirements within the lead reference guide. Version two is sort of the baseline, it's where it all started. And then as we sort of expand through the versions, you'll see that the scope of who can be included in a, as the commissioning authority changes. Uh, specifically, you can see here that from version two to version 2.2, they added that the commissioning authority cannot be directly responsible for design or construction, except for smaller projects, those under 50,000 square feet. If we go to the next slide, we can see here that version 2009 more clearly defined which systems at that point were required to be included in the commissioning process. So outside of just the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration systems, they now define it as also including lighting and daylighting controls, domestic hot water systems, and renewable energy systems, such as wind and solar. Version four and 4.1, Go back up, Josh, sorry. Yeah, version four and 4.1 also reduced the, uh, who can be the commissioning authority again from the 50,000 square foot exception down to 20,000 square foot. So now it's just very small buildings uh, where the commissioning authority can be someone who has direct responsibility for the design and construction. Above 20,000 square feet, the commissioning authority may not be directly responsible for any design or construction. It also includes here a few specific reference standards for commissioning, which is actually guideline zero or NIBS guideline three, 2012. And then if we go to the next slide, Josh. Um, version four and 4.1 add these last three elements. So that's the CFR and O&M plan, which is the current facilities requirements and operations and maintenance plans. Essentially those documents outline uh, the, the, the settings for the systems, as well as how to operate and maintain the systems um, throughout the life of the building. This is important for operations and maintenance staff to have available as it allows them to make sure everything is set up and working as expected. Then the electrical and plumbing scopes were expanded. And also a big change here is that the envelope commissioning is included partially within the fundamental commissioning. Envelope uh, requirements are now, now expected within the OPR, which is the owner's project requirements and the basis of design. You do not need to do full envelope commissioning for fundamental commissioning, but you do have to include those elements within the OPR and BOD. Finally, uh, my last slide here before we, we hand it over to Josh is enhanced commissioning changes. This sort of outlines the differences between version two all the way to where we are again, currently version four and 4.1. One of the big changes that has occurred over time is when this commissioning agent or commissioning authority is involved in the process. As you can see in starting in version two, the commissioning authority only needed to be involved prior to construction document phase. However, as we move across all the way to version four, you can see that it's now before design development phase. So that's quite a bit earlier in the process. And it's so that the commissioning authority can check to make sure that the OPR and BOD are being carried through throughout the design and construction documents. Additionally, again, the scope of who can be the commissioning authority has changed uh, with version 2.1. It, it just says uh, that they can't be part of the design review team. In 2009, the commissioning authority can't be part of the design team nor the construction team. 
And that is the same in version four and 4.1. And then in version four and 4.1, we introduced some new pathways or options. Option one, path one is enhanced commissioning. That's pretty consistent with what it has been previously in version 2.2 and version 2009. Option one, path two is that same enhanced commissioning, but with the addition of monitoring based commissioning. Monitoring based commissioning is sort of a more real time version of measurement and verification from previous versions. But what it essentially boils down to is that you've included some sensors and meters on your uh, energy use systems so that you can continuously monitor and ensure correct operation and performance of those systems as you move through the year or life of the building. And then finally, option two, which is all new in version four and 4.1 is envelope commissioning. And envelope commissioning is taking a building upon the OPR and BOD requirements within fundamental commissioning and then testing the performance of those envelope enclosures. That can be done, done in a sampling method or it can be done on the final construction in the field. And it's basically taking the same process that you would apply to your mechanical or electrical systems and applying that pre-functional che uh, checklist as well as the functional performance testing to the building envelope. So with that, Josh, if you want to take over. Thank you, Jason. So we talked, Jason talked a lot about how the commissioning and the fundamental commissioning and the enhanced commissioning requirements have changed um, through the various versions of LEED. So now we want to really talk about um, is a third party commissioning agent required? Basically, who can be the commissioning agent? So there are separate requirements for the, the fundamental and verification prerequisite. That's this column here. And then the enhanced commissioning credit. Um, which is the, the column, the column right here. So what do we mean by um, a third party? So if you're looking at um, like an employee of the architect or the engineering firm, um, if, if they're wanting to be the, also the commissioning agent. So if it's a member of the, the design team, so the, the project architect or the, MEP engineer, possibly even the energy modeler, um, that is not allowed. It has to be, uh, if it's an mem uh, employee of the architecture firm or the engineering firm, then in order to qualify as the commissioning agent, you cannot be a member of the design team. So essentially, you have to be um, a, a third party, even if you are an employee. And you are only eligible, if you are the case, to be the commissioning agent for the prerequisite. You cannot be the, the commissioning agent, or you cannot get credit for enhanced commissioning if you have a member of the design team as your commissioning agent. Um, also here, if you have a, a sub-consultant to the architecture, architect or the engineering firm, um, if it's a, again, if it's a member of the design team, um, then that would not qualify for the commissioning agent. But a subconsultant to the architect or the engineering firm that isn't a member of the design team, that's allowed to be the commissioning agent for both the, the prerequisite and the enhanced. Um, similarly, if you're if it's uh, employee or subcontractor of the general contractor, it's pretty similar. So if it's a member of the construction team, then that wouldn't be allowed. If it was not a member of the construction team, then that would be allowed for the prerequisite only, uh, not the enhanced. But um, essentially, this bottom row here, an employee of the owner or an independent consultant contracted to the owner, that's eligible for both the fundamental uh, commissioning 
and verification prerequisite and the enhanced commissioning. So <clears throat> this is what we see the most of, which, you know, it's a, a dedicated commissioning agent that isn't uh, an employee of the architect or engineering firm or the general contractor. So this is this is all in the the credit language, this this table here of, of who can be the, the commissioning agent. So there's a pretty big difference between the um, the fundamental commissioning prerequisite and the enhanced commissioning. Um, so the the requirement for the commissioning agent to be an independent third party incorporated into the lead enhanced commissioning requirements um, is so there's really no conflicts of interest. And to ensure that the, the commissioning agent is an independent advocate um, to the owner of the project and will objectively verify that the building meets the, the owner's project requirement and intent. So that's why we're really strict on who can uh, qualify to be the, the enhanced commissioning agent because, yeah, we, we really want to make sure that the that the commissioning agent is doing everything they can and is independently advocating for the for the owner and the the OPR that was developed. So now we're going to talk about what documentation is required. And we have similar slides where it goes through the, the historical documentation changes. So the Version two, um, all we really required was the commissioning plan and um, a signed letter that the plan was executed. Moving on to version 2.2 .2 and version 2009, we started to uh, require more documentation. So we started, we wanted to see the, the commissioning agent's experience um, and basically just to make sure that the commissioning agent has um, done commissioning work on at least two similar buildings. So if you're working on a on an office, just making sure that the commissioning agent had had commissioned two previous office buildings before that were you know similar size and complexities. Um, we also required that the commission commissioning agent be on board prior to the construction document phase. Um, again, the, the independence of the commissioning agent, which was going back to the who can be the commissioning agent slide. Uh, ensuring that the commissioning agent reports directly to the owner. Um, a re re requirement that the commissioning agent has re reviewed the, the OPR and the BOD and design prior to mid-construction document phase. And so that requirement was so if the commissioning agent saw anything that was deficient in, you know, the, the BOD or the design, it's prior to the mid-construction document phase. So there's still time for any changes to be incorporated into the final construction documents. Um, we also require that the commissioning agent review the contractor submittals concurrent with the design team, um, ensuring that they um, provide the system manual and then ensuring that the staff training had been done as well. And so with version four and version 4.1, there aren't any additional documentations from version 2009 documentation that's required but we just added the, the options that, uh, that Jason had talked about a couple of slides previously. So what are some common issues that we see in the lead documentation? So um, the first one is incomplete commissioning. So every, all of the systems maybe weren't commissioned or they, there were, weren't, um, you know, functional performance tests done, things of that nature. 
Uh, the second thing is issues with the scope of work. So maybe, you know, maybe there, there weren't, um, there weren't systems that were within the scope of work for the design team. So those didn't get, uh, those didn't get commissioned. Um, so the next thing is the, the incomplete current facility requirement in O and M plan. So this is the, these are the documents that are turned over to the, the building users. And, you know, if you have a, an energy manager that, that runs all of the building systems within the building. So it's important for the facility requirement document O and M plan to be complete so they can run the building as optimally as possible. Uh, similarly, um, incomplete ongoing commissioning plan, uh, we see issues with that. Um, and incomplete functional performance tests. So did the, uh, a functional performance test of like a, like an air cooled chiller, um, or an air handling unit, did it step through all of the, all of the steps in the sequence of operations, we we look at, at down into into those details to make sure that the functional performance tests were were done correctly. And then uh, another issue is that uh, one of our requirements within the commissioning plan is for a, an issue log to be maintained. So uh, it's an identification of all of the issues that the commissioning agent finds throughout the, the various steps of the process. And if those issues have been resolved or if they're still outstanding. So we, we look to ensure that the, that the issue log is, is incorporated into the commissioning plan as well. So really, I think we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how, how the commissioning prerequisite and enhanced commissioning credit has evolved throughout the various versions of LEED. We've talked about what the requirements are, um, you know, what we're, what we're expected to see as reviewers. I think this section might be one of the most important though, uh, in my opinion, is what's the owner's role in all of this? So really, we want the owner to be the driver of the commissioning process. So it's really important that the, that the owner is involved and the owner is um, familiar with, with the commissioning process. It's also important that the, the owner hires the right teams, uh, stay involved from the beginning of the end, um, requires reporting directly to them and drive optimum building performance. So it's, it's, it's very important for, for the owners to, um, steer. I didn't, I didn't want to say any, any English idioms, um, because I don't know how they would translate to Spanish, but, um, uh, the, the owner is, is really, uh, steering the ship, if you will. So it's important for, for them to be involved. So, how is this all beneficial? So, you know, what's what's the point of of commissioning, and and how is it beneficial for the for the project? And much like the the previous slides, we're going to take a look at this as more of a kind of a historical perspective from Lee. So, in the first version, version two, um, the benefits of commissioning was was laid out and really what they were or the original outline of the benefits of commissioning was that it's environmental impact reduction through a reduction in greenhouse gases, uh, resource extraction and improved air quality. Uh, commissioning is also economically beneficial because of the reduced operational costs, increased efficiency, reduced occupant complaints, and overall greater work productivity. Um, commissioning also provides health benefits, providing a healthy and comfortable indoor environment for the building occupants. So if we look at what the, 
version four benefits of commissioning are, it's very similar to what we had in um, in version two. And you know the the highlights of the slide is that it leads to fewer change orders with the commissioning agent involved early in the process because they're they're really checking out um, the design and making sure that it um, is consistent with the OPR and the BOB. Um, so fewer change orders and system deficiencies. Um, it'll lead to fewer corrective actions needing to be implemented implemented while the contractors are on site. Um, improved planning coordination and ultimately uh, reduced energy consumption for the building operation, uh, lower operating costs, and potentially um, the health and comfort of the occupants are improved as well. So this is just a, a slide that summarizes the, the benefits of commissioning from the previous slide. So this is a pretty interesting um, slide here because it it really it it shows the the project timeline. It breaks it up from the design phase, construction phase. Uh, this is post construction. So once the building is completed, then the commissioning agent is in the testing phase, and then they're also involved for enhanced fish, um, enhanced commissioning for. Um, a 10 month after occupancy uh, operation occupancy phase. So what are all the steps involved in the commissioning process during this project timeline? So right off the bat, we're gonna develop the, the owner project requirement, which is the OPR and the basis of the basis of design, which is the, the BOD. And what the BOD is, is the design team's um, version of the OPR. So the owner is gonna lay out the expectations, goals, and success criteria um, with measurable benchmarks for the rest of the team. And then the design team will go off and they'll develop a basis of design based off of the the owner's project requirements. So once this happens, then the commissioning agent will come in and check both of those documents and then develop a commissioning plan, um, do the design review uh, about midway through the design, um, develop the commissioning specifications. And then once the design is complete, the commissioner will have a, a construction kickoff meeting. So during the construction phase, they'll update the commissioning plan, um, go through their, their pre-functional checklist. So that could be anything from, um, you know, just going in and watching systems get installed um, and going through a, a pre-functional checklist of those systems uh, to the pre-functional inspection. So they'll, they'll inspect the, um, installation of the equipment. And then once the construction is um, pretty well complete and the systems are all in, they'll be ready for the, the functional testing phase, which again, the, the functional testing would be going in and for, I, I think I used a, an air-cooled chiller, um, going in and going through all of the steps in the sequence of operation and testing all of the all of the functions of that particular uh, piece of equipment. So then they'll go through all of the functional testing, um, ensure that the corrective issues and resolution tracking has been done. So again, going back to the, the issue log, going through the, the various issues that they found and uh, identifying who's responsible for fixing it and just making sure that that, that gets fixed. Um, and then once that's completed, then they'll go through the, the operation and maintenance staff training. So that's where they're actually training the, the building operators in how to best and optimally run the building. 
Uh, once that's complete, they'll turn the building over. Um, and then, yeah, they'll, they'll deliver the, the systems manual to the, the building operators and then go through the, the monitoring based commissioning process. If, if, uh, if that option is being pursued. So again, we've, we've talked about the, the documents, documentation that's required. So what deliverables are required for lead? So the commissioning agent experience. So we've established it's the person, not the, not the commissioning organization, the actual person that's going to be the, the commissioning agent, what their experience is and ensuring that they're, um, they worked on a, on at least two similar sized and um, building type buildings before uh, the commissioning plan, the completed functional performance tests, the CFR requirements of the O and M plan, and the commissioning report and operators and occupants training plan, and then finally the ongoing commissioning. So I think we covered a lot of information in a, a pretty short amount of time. So we're available for any questions any any of uh, the meeting participants may have. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jason, Josh, and, and Maria Alex. We do have some questions. I'm going to read them for you. Uh, about the commissioning agent, uh, do they need any badge, certificate, or credential? Can you hear me? Yeah, Jason. You're muted. Yeah, I, I couldn't unmute, sorry. Uh, no, they don't need any actually, um, they don't need any official credentialing. Obviously that could be beneficial to the process. What all they really need is to have prior, prior experience on two similar projects. Thank you, Jason. Uh, another question, what is the role of the commissioning process in LEED V4.1 for existing buildings? Josh, do you have a good answer on this one? I mean, it's very <laughs> similar. We, we actually don't work directly in existing buildings. I know the process is similar and the intent is very similar, but um, obviously the building's already existing. So I, I think it's just on what systems are included in the existing building. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it's dependent on the building and yeah, what, what systems are, are in there. And, um, yeah, ultimately, I think with the existing buildings, it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, emphasis on establishing the scope of work and uh, commissioning systems as, as required. Thank you. And we have another one here. Could you tell us more about how the commissioning process helps the health and well-being of occupants? So with that, um, I, one of the things to, to keep in mind that there, there are lead requirements for um, indoor air quality. So um, whether it be the, the implementation of the, you know, the MERV, MERV 8 or MERV 13 filters for the requirement of um, one of the EQ prerequisites um, or ensuring that uh, the the proper amount of outdoor air is being brought into the building for the uh, minimum indoor air quality performance prerequisite those are the ways in which um, any issues that can be found with um, those prerequisites or credits will ultimately help with the, the health of the occupants be, be, through the uh, improved indoor air quality. 
Thank you. We have another one, maybe, um, well, I read to you. What are the differences between the commission process and an energy audit? But similar to existing buildings. So I don't know if you have the answer to that. So I think um, with a, the commissioning process, I think would be more of a more of a holistic process as it's an approach from the start of even the design phase all the way to uh, post construction. So it's a it's a process that depending on the complexity of the building um, could take years and. and pretty much you know mostly on, on large commercial buildings it is a it is a commitment that will take years to um, complete and so the commissioning agent is involved um, in all of the decision making and review really from the start of the design phase and whereas an energy audit would just be you know a company that comes in um, however many years down the line once the building's completed and then just goes through and checks the um you know what whatever they're they're checking if it's an audit that they're just trying to identify uh energy conservation measures that could be um implemented to to help with the overall uh operation of the building um and i think there there is a process in commissioning which is uh retro commissioning where they come in after the fact and essentially do that work and identify any type of uh deficiencies that may have occurred through the the normal wear and tear of the operation of, of the of the building and the building systems thank you we have another one here uh, can a project have more than one commissioning agent? Oftentimes, it's a commissioning team. So it's a it's a team of commissioning agents where, um, you know, maybe one one commissioning agent is more uh, experienced with the the design phase aspects of it, and then there are others that are more experienced in the the um, the on site aspects of testing. And whatnot, um, but ultimately there is uh, one commissioning agent that maybe it's the the project manager on the commissioning team that is responsible for um, the the implementation of all of the all of the various requirements and you know done by by whomever on the on the commissioning agents team. Yeah, there is one um, one exception where you can actually have two separate commissioning authorities, and that's when you pursue the envelope commissioning credit. Uh, so you could have one commissioning authority or commissioning agent for basically everything except the envelope, and then a separate one for the envelope commissioning. I don't know if Tatiana is frozen or if we put her to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think she had some trouble. Uh, so I don't know from the audience, there's another question that you can share with us so Josh and Jason can answer it. Let's give a second to Tatiana. Yeah, she's having trouble. She's getting connected in this moment. Okay. Okay, I don't know if you have any experience of a, okay, of how or which are the recommendations uh, in hiring a commissioning agent, maybe, that you can guide us? Jason, 
Josh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think. Go ahead. I, I think that um, you would you would definitely want to um, look at the the experience level um, because there is commissioning is commissioning is not an easy it's not easy thing to do and it's you it does take a, a special uh skill set to successfully be a commissioning agent um i was not i was a i was a design engineer and an energy modeler um and oftentimes you know as the as a design engineer you would get a little annoyed with the commissioning agent because they would just come in and tell you all the things that you did wrong but it's it's invaluable in the the overall design um of the building so you just you just have to as a consultant you have to um you know just have the bigger picture in mind and just understand that you're not being picked on it's for the betterment of the building so i think with uh, a commissioning agent it's it's really important that that commissioning agent be experienced and um have a a really uh high level of, of attention to detail okay thank you tatiana you're back <laughs> i am so sorry about that something happened and i i, I had like a second question with the with the last one i did so uh, i don't know if um well i read it to you <laughs> Uh, about the question with the, uh, a lot of commissioning agents, one for each system. How is the documentation process in those cases? So, so you wouldn't have one commissioning agent for each system. The, you, you have to have one person that oversees the entire process. You can sort of divvy up the work to a degree, but still that person that oversees the process needs to be uh, supervising all of those different systems. The, the one example I gave was, was envelope commissioning, which is just one, one option under the credit. If you pursue that one option, you can have someone that's completely different for envelope commissioning. And, and the thought process there is typically, um, typically you're building commissioning individuals are those that have an engineering background or more of an energy background. But with the envelope commissioning, it makes sense for that person to potentially have an architectural background or something along those lines where they're more familiar with the building envelope enclosures. Thank you. And I have one last question. One last question. Uh, how can a person um, learn how to do the commissioning process and become a commissioning agent? Yeah, so typically you'll work with an experienced commissioning agent and gain the ex requisite experience. Um, that's usually more than two projects, just as someone that has done some commissioning in the past, especially if it's a more complex project. Um, and, then, and then you would eventually transition into the role of being the commissioning authority. So, so you, you will do work under a commissioning authority for a while until you feel, until you're confident and competent enough to be the commissioning authority yourself. Yes. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, even though there's no need to have a credential uh, to be a commission, a commissioning agent, can you share with us which institutions give that kind of credentialing or trainings? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> no, I, I, I think there's a few, but I'm trying to think there's a BCX, which is building commissioning group. Okay. Yeah, there's a, a, a certified commissioning professional, and that's accredited through uh, ANSI. Um, yeah. Okay. There's a Thank few you. out there, but um, but like I said, it's not actually required for lead purposes. It just okay. just gives you a better background on on what to what to do. Yeah, the the building commissioning professional certification is through ASHRAE, so um, that's that's definitely um, you know certainly a, a valid accreditation. If it's if, especially since it's through ASHRAE. 
Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, all of you. I don't have any other questions, so I guess everything is clear. I don't know if perhaps you want to say something before we say goodbye, Maria Alex. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Josh, for for sharing all these like uh, great and super useful information for our market. Uh, it's been super clear, something that it's super technical. It's been super clear even for me that I have no experience um, in, in lead, like in, in, a, in, in a building site or inside a project. Um, so thank you for that. Y, y, y ahora para todos, pues agradecerles el haber participado aquí. Eh, yo creo que hoy, hoy, se aclaró mucho más esa, esa, esa visión o, esa, o ese rol y ese proceso de comisionamiento eh, y creo que esta herramienta va a quedar de mucha utilidad para todo el mercado eh, en los diferentes medios que se comuniquen. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, Tatiana. Thank you, Maria Alex. Uh, perhaps Jason, do you want to say something before we say goodbye? Uh, well, I don't know how to follow that up, <laughs> but... <laughs> but thank you for your time. And if, if you do have any other questions or any questions pop up, you can reach out to Josh or I and, and we'll get you an answer. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's it's one of the more difficult things is trying to uh, boil all this down and just, you know, not get uh, too into the details because uh, both Jason and I can get into the details pretty quickly. So um, I'm, hopefully this, this was helpful for everyone. and. Yeah, like Jason said, we, we went over a lot of information. So if anybody has any particular questions, uh, feel free to, to reach out to either one of us. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, muchas gracias a todos por habernos acompañado en el día de hoy. Eh, aprovecho para los que me escribieron que estaban interesados en temas de comisionamiento, que tenemos un curso que arranca a finales de julio, entonces pueden escribirnos por interno para poderles dar mayor información. Eh, Josh, Jason, Mariales, again, thank you so much for joining us today and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Happy weekend for all. Feliz fin de semana. Gracias.